Hi, welcome everyone to today's talk, Crop and Food, Soybean in Chinese Food Culture. This is the seventh talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential applications of agricultural products. We hope the series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speaker, Professor Angela Leung, who is the director of the Hong Kong Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences. Chair Professor of History, Joseph Litham Philip Mao, Professor at the University of Hong Kong. Elected academician of the Academy Syndicate, Taiwan. She was a researcher at the Academic Syndicate and taught history at UCLA. Also, National Taiwan University and then the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She had published in Chinese, English, and French on the history of Chinese philanthropy, social history of medicine, and more recently on food and health. Her books in English include Leprosy in China, a history, 2009, Health and Hygiene in Chinese East Asia, 2010, co-edited with Charlotte Firth. Gender, Health and History in East Asia, published in 2017, co-edited with Isomi Nakayama. Moral Foods, the construction of health regimes in modern Asia, published in 2019, co-edited with Melissa Kostro. She is leading a collaborative project on everyday technologies in modern East Asia and writing a book on the history of soy sauce. In the following presentation, she is going to introduce the unique role of soybean in Chinese food culture by taking the example of the history of soy sauce and illustrates the significant shift in soybean cultivation in its long history as an indigenous food crop and as a global commodity. Now, let's welcome Professor Leung to the fore. Professor Leung, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lam. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this talk series. Um, I'm very honored to be uh, part of the, the series. Uh, I have attended a couple of the talks um, uh, earlier, and, and I learned a lot from the scientists. Mo most of the speakers were scientists or economists, and I suppose I'm one of the very few um, humanists and social scientists in this series. And I hope that, um, you know, um, we can we can learn from each other on this very interesting and very important topic. So um, let me share screen. Um, today I'm going to talk about soybeans, basically, and soybeans um, known in ancient China, Shu, um, is one of known as one of the five grains of five uh, grains and legumes of Wu. And uh, of course, it is not as iconic as rice, which is the most important um, food crop in China, and, and also not as a staple crop like wheat or barley or millet. But I think um, what is interesting about soybean is that it has a very unique role in Chinese food culture, especially in the modern period. And this will be the focus of my talk today. I, I want today. I want to take two examples to illustrate my point: the the unique role of soybeans in Chinese food culture. First of all, uh, soy sauce as an everyday food. Uh, this is uh, a, a book project that I'm working on. And then a second aspect of soy of soybeans in Chinese food culture is vegetarian movement. Uh, what I mean is secular vegetarian movement. I'm not uh, discussing the Buddhist tradition, 
of vegetarianism. And um, you know, so, so these are the two examples I'm, I'm taking today. And then I'm going to talk about not the whole history, but I'm just talking about two critical periods in the history of these two um, uh, uh, phenomena. First is the turn of the 20th century, uh, when China was the biggest world producer of soybeans. And then the second period is turn of the 21st century, which is today, when China is the biggest soybean importer. So um, soybean as a, as a crop has a very amazing world history. And it affects food culture of the whole world. So I, I want to illustrate this phenomenal change with these two examples. So first of all, soy, soy sauce. Soy sauce, this is what we see in supermarkets in soy sauce. They are very ch cheap. They have a lot of brands. You can buy them very easily. It's an everyday food. You don't pay any attention to it. You don't even know that it has a history. So the question when I look at a bottle of soy sauce is to ask, when did it become an everyday food? If you look at history, um, let us first look at how soy sauce was, is made. It's a two-stage fermentation. First of all, you boil the soy or steam the soybeans, and then you, you can mix it with grain flour, like wheat flour or rice flour, and so on, some carbohydrate. And then you put it in a warm place, allow the mixture to ferment. When the, when the, when the yeast uh, grows, on the mixture, you mix it with a salt solution, a brine, and then you put it in a, in a container, in a ceramic barrel, in a wooden barrel, whatever you have, and then you continue fermentation in an enclosed container for months or even for years. And then when it's, the brewing is done, uh, it, will, it will produce a dark liquid, which we call jiangyou, soy sauce. And then after filtering with the residue, you have the soy sauce. So the principle is that the yeast, the ferment or the chu, that we call in Chinese, disintegrates the protein. You know, you know the soybeans has a lot of protein. And it dissolves, disintegrates the protein in all kinds of amino acids, which, which provide a very unique taste, a very complex and unique taste to, to the sauce. And then the yeast also turns the starch, you know, the flour, the starch in the flour into sugar. So, so the, the soy sauce can be relatively salty, relatively sweet, depends on how much soybean you use, how much starch, how much, how much uh, flour you use. So this is look like a fairly simple procedure. And on the, on the right, it, this is, um, uh, soy sauce in the middle of, of the second stage of fermentation in a, in a ceramic barrel. And when is the first written record of soy sauce? It's in a 14th century text. Uh, maybe it was made before the 14th century, but it was the written record. The first written web record that we can find today is dated 14th century. It's written by a very famous artist called Ni Zan in his book, um, called Dietary Regime in the Cloud Forest Studio. Uh, Ni Zan is a, is a Yuan artist. And as you can imagine, he's, he's an artist, he's a bon vivant, he knows how to live, he knows how to eat well. So he recalls that he was the first person to write down the recipe, and that is the, the term he used. He used Huangzi. Huangzi is uh, soybeans fermented. In the first stage, you, you use one dough, which is one to two liters of the soybeans, and then, and then uh, you ferment it, and then you use 10 kettles of salt, 20 kettles of water, mix them in the summer because it needs a lot of heat for fermentation, and then you have it. Of course, this description is extremely simple. If you are given this recipe, you cannot, you do not know how to mix soy sauce. But at least we know that the recipe was known 
already in the 14th century, maybe earlier, but we, we, don't, we are not sure. However, commercial um, uh, enterprises, commercial shops that make, that make and sold soy sauces, all kinds of soy foods, did not appear until the mid to late Qing period, which is after the 18th century. And then they became this, these um, uh, pickle shops we call, Jiangyue, these pickle shops um, became a landmark in major cities. So for example, Beijing was very famous for this pickle shop co called Liu Biju. And then uh, on, the, on the right, you can see an, uh, uh, a very, another very famous pickle shop in Shandong, Qinning. Uh, and then in Shanghai, you also have a couple of pickle shops. So, so commercial pickle shops only appear, and, and they, they appear in big numbers in the 19th century. And also, in the night, from 18th century on, you begin to see um, the use of soy sauce in recipes. In homemade recipe, you know how you look, you use it how to to cook cook vegetable meat, all kinds of foods, and and they appear in great numbers after the 18th century, but not before. So you wonder why, if the technique of making the sauce is available, was available since the 14th century, not not uh, not not after, you know, very early on, and why was it commercialized so late? And my answer is really in the, is the, the question of soybean production. This is my explanation. Um, the fact that soy, soy sauce became an everyday food was a, res, was a phenomena of uh, the integration of Manchuria in Qing Empire. We know that the major soybean producing region in China was Manchuria, in Chinese we call Dongbei. And Dongbei was not integrated into China before the mid 18th century. When the Qing, when the Manchus conquered China, they had a ban, they had, they had a, a, a ban on exportation of soybeans because soybeans was used to feed horses and camels and, um, you know, poor soldiers. And so they, they, they were in, in dire needs of these crops for their armies. It's just like fuel for, for, for cars and for airplanes today. So the Manchus did not allow the ex exportation of Manchurian soybeans to the rest of China at the beginning. And then it was, the ban was lifted only after the mid 18th century during the Qianlong period, because by that time, um, the Qing Empire the Qing um, political regime felt it was secure enough to allow exportation of soybeans. You know, their political power is very solid. Uh, they, have, they are in full control of China. And so they, feel, they felt free to allow this uh, grain, uh, allow this legume to be exported. And then also, we all know that we, uh, if we know a little bit of Qing history, we know that the, the Manchus also uh, uh, have a maritime, a ban on maritime trade because they also feel, felt um, a potential threat from uh, enemies uh, from, from the seas. So, um, and then they, when they were secured politically, they allow a maritime trade to resume only after the 18th century. And then also they, now allow the immigration of Chinese into Manchuria in this period, after this period. At, at first, they did not allow um, uh, Chinese to immigrate because it was the land of the homeland of the Manchus. They, they are very jealous of it. They want to keep it to themselves. Now, after the 18th century, when they were very secure politically, they allow all, they lifted all the spans. And then what happened? And then you have a gigantic jump in Manchurian soybean production in the 19th and early 20th centuries because only the Chinese peasants knew how to cultivate soybeans. The, the Manchus, they were nomads, they were not peasants. And only when a huge number of Chinese peasants immigrated into Manchuria 
that soybeans cultivation became a massive and very lucrative activity. So that was when um, soy sauce, uh, soybeans were exported to the rest of China, which allowed a very active commercialization of all kinds of soy foods, especially uh, soybeans, soy sauce. Um, and um, I would like to give an example of that, the scale of the size. We have a, um, uh, a survey in the 1930s in Jiangnan, um, and that survey showed that the per capita, per, the annual per capita soy sauce consumption was something like almost nine kilograms. It's, it's, it's a lot um, per capita annual, uh, 8.85 uh, kilograms. And given the population of that region um, in the 1930s, the whole region, I mean, the, 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 um, the amount of soy, soybeans needed to produce a soy sauce for, for, the, for the need of everybody was something around 15.8 million kilograms. And if you think, if you look at the amount of soybeans which um, were allowed to, which were available um, in this region in the late 17th century, which is the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, it was only 11.8 million kilograms. So it was not even, the, that amount was not even sufficient for Jiangnan region. But then after, the Manchurian uh, uh, past, pasta land became a, uh, uh, became a producer, the biggest producer of soybeans. Um, we see an explosion of um, uh, exportation of soy, soy, soybeans um, in, in China. And in the, late in, in the late 18th century, export came to 68.4 million kilograms. And, and in the 1930s, it went all the way up to 132.5 million kilograms. So it was really the availability of soybeans in all parts of China that produce soy sauce as an everyday commodity. Now, this is a piece of news in New York Times in 1928. It says Manchuria, produce 80% of soybeans for the world. So that, that was the time when soy sauce in China became an everyday food. Now, let me come to the second critical period of soy sauce, which is now, today, in the 21st century. Uh, it is still an everyday food, but more interestingly, Soy sauce has become an heritage, a heritage food, a food that represents Chinese tradition. Uh, it's really about the recreation of tradition. Um, you know, in different places, people represent a tradition in different ways. Just give you a couple of examples. In Hong Kong, for example, this this um, soy sauce maker. Uh, of this ad on a tram, which is which is a very traditional Hong Kong tram, saying that you know this this enterprise has 93 years of history, and it has maintained the same tradition of making soy sauce, which is sunning the barrels of soy sauce for six months, and and so on and so forth. So this is how Hong Kong enterprise will sell the soy sauce. It's a traditional continent that represents the taste of Hong Kong food. And in China, in mainland China, the biggest soy sauce companies, which has quite a bit of state support, like Jia Jia and Hai Tian, they will sell uh, uh, soy sauce as a heritage food that represents 3,000 years of Chinese history. Of course, this is soy sauce doesn't have 3,000 years of history, but that doesn't matter. You know, um, soy sauce re represents Chinese civilization, and Chinese civilization is supposed to have 3,000 years of history, and that is that is what makes soy sauce sell on a global scale. 
But what is more interesting for, for my purpose is to look at how soy sauce can define, so, uh, soybeans can define um, soy sauce as a heritage food. This is the example of Taiwan. Uh, this, um, this, this, if you read Chinese, you will see um, that the character means that the root of Taiwanese soy sauce is in black beans. The Chinese, uh, the Taiwanese traditional way of making soy sauce was using the indigenous black beans. But then when the Japanese occupied Taiwan, um, the, 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 and, and the Taiwanese just took up the Japanese way of making soy, soy sauce by using yellow beans. And then they gave up black beans. And then afterwards, when the Japanese left, they picked up black beans again because it is their original material of making soy sauce. And now, um, Taiwan soy sauce maker is very, very keen on making uh, soy sauce with black beans also cultivated in Taiwan, so an indigenous crop. I will go back to this um, part later in this talk. So it's a state promotion of indigenous black beans for heritage soy sauce in Taiwan since 2010. So they have developed more than three types. There are, there are more than three types now. They, 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 they give them names, some in Tainan, some in uh, uh, Miaoli, and so on and so forth. And, they, uh, and, and, and the best soy sauce were all made from indigenous black beans. And uh, there's a state program to encourage the recultivation of indigenous black beans. And the state will work with uh, uh, soy sauce makers to make this uh, possible. If you look at the photo, you can see MIT so MIT means made in Taiwan. Um, that means qi zuo. Qi zuo means that soy sauce company will sign a contract with the peasants who will cultivate black beans uh, that the, that the uh, enterprises will buy back to make soy sauce. So, so that's the way that the state um, encouraged the recultivation of black beans. And so soy sauce became a very, soy sauce maker became a very active participant in this state project. Okay, I will go back to that a little bit later. Now, let us go to the second phenomenon that I would like to look at um, uh, on the question of soybeans, and that is secular vegetarian movement. So the first secular Modern, the first modern secular vegetarian movement took place at the turn of the 20th century, very much at the same time of, um, uh, uh, you know, of soy sauce becoming an everyday food. And this movement was led by political elites. And the most famous, the most important of these political elites was Li Zhizheng, Li Zhizheng who was, uh, he, he was a, really a pioneer of vegetarianism. He's of, of course, if you know that part of his Chinese history well, he's a, one of the first Chinese anarchists, a revolutionary, Esperantist, Esperantist, a very idealist um, uh, intellectual. And he studied in France, uh, just before, shortly before the, the fall of the Qing Dynasty, and he wrote a dissertation in the Pasteur Institute in Paris in 1908, precisely on, soy, on soybeans. And the title of the, of the dissertation is uh, The Soy, Its Alimentary, Therapeutic, Agricultural, and Industrial Uses. So, so the whole point he want to make is to show the value of soybeans uh, which is which was a Chinese food that, that, that Europeans knew relatively little about, and so he um, not only he did you know scientific research on on the soybeans, he's also an activist in vegetarianism. 
he when he went when when he returned to China, he translated parts of his dissertation into Chinese to uh, promote knowledge of soybeans. And he written, he has published a lot of articles um, on site on uh, uh, you know parts of his dissertation. And on top of that, he established a bean curd factory in Paris. You know, at the time when he was finishing his uh, dissertation, there were different theories on why he did that. Some said that he wanted to um, he wanted to finance the revolution because he was also very close to Sun Yat-sen, um, the father of the Chinese Republic, and um, the others said that he just wanted to uh, show Westerners the value of bean curds. And what is more interesting is his influence on Sun Yat-sen. Um, we all know that Sun Yat-sen is the father of the Chinese Republic. He has wrote, written the San Yun Tu, he the three principles of the people on, on races, on, on constitutions, on everything. But in 1919, he wrote the strategy of building our nation, and maybe you, maybe you do not realize that he, the first chapter of his the strategy of building our nation is on food and drink. So it's something for him to build a Chinese nation, to take care of the food problems is, is very important. And there he is clearly influenced by Li Shizhen. He, and for those of you who can read Chinese, you can uh, 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 look at the text. But let me just explain this few Chinese sentences. Uh, Sun Yat-sen considered Chinese dietetics the most sophisticated part in Chinese culture. He thought that China was backward in many areas, but but in, in dietetics, in food, China is more advanced than the Western countries, he thought. And one example he gave to illustrate this point was precisely bean curd that he could describe as the meat in China's largely vegetarian diet. With bean curd, he said, Chinese vegetarianism was superior to the rather crude Western system that they just eat vegetables which is very low in protein. He claimed that this was why, the, 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 that bean curd was why all Chinese were accustomed to the vegetarian diet then proven by Western science to be beneficial to health and longevity. Bean curd was also the reason why most Chinese practice simple vegetarian diets without having to know the science. Because it was so good to eat, you just eat it. You don't, don't think about whether this is, it is nutritious or not. And so Chinese vegetarian diets with bean curds for Sun Yat-sen explain the long life expectancy of poor peasants and of the resistance to diseases as shown by Chinese huge population. Sun Yat-sen's assessment of the Chinese vegetarian diet of the time had a clear nationalistic touch. For him, the Chinese were talented vegetarian practitioners to have included the nutritious and tasty soy food that was greatly beneficial to the nation's health. At a time when China was the world's leading soybean producer and exporter by a huge margin, that is more than 80% of world production, Sun Yat-sen envisioned a bright future for the new republic when its people were eating properly with a stable agriculture, agricultural economy. His view, I think, is borrowed from Li Zhidun's um, understanding of soybeans. In another article, Li Zhidun said that if China, if the Chinese could go, all Chinese could go vegetarian, China could feed 30% more people uh, than if they eat meat. He suggested that China should encourage a national vegetarian culture and should not be misled to develop meat industries as in the West. So Sun Yat-sen took his view and put it in the first chapter of his strategy of building our nation. So that's how important Sorbin was at that time. Now let us look at vegetarian movement in today, in today's um, China in the early 21st century. 
But this movement was no longer led by political elites, but it was led by, it is led by a middle class, uh, middle classes in, in China, as well as in Taiwan and in Hong Kong. It's a middle class phenomenon. And in China, there is a very dynamic movement going on. Um, and, uh, and there, uh, you see, they, they are, the, the, the three points they claim is to move towards plant-based diets, to reduce food waste, and to change our global food production patterns. So, so it has a completely different narrative than one century ago. And we can also see a very rapid increase of Chinese vegetarian restaurants. This is the graph, the, the growth of Chinese, uh, of vegetarian restaurants in China from 1999 to, to uh, 2019. And it, it is estimated that at the moment, the number of vegetarian population in China is around 50 million to 68 million, which is about four to 5%. And in Taiwan, the number of vegetarians is estimated to, to be around 3.2 million, which is 13% of population. Actually, Taiwan is one of the most, uh, in, 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 in terms of proportion, is one of the most um, uh, uh, advanced in um, vegetarian movement uh, today. And Taipei was considered one of the top global vegetarian cities with a, a, a huge number. Of vegetarian restaurants. Uh, and even, you know, this, uh, the, vegeta the vegetarian movement in, in China and in Taiwan, in, in fact, is part of a global trend. Um, in an article in The Economist, the journal Economist, um, uh, uh, one year ago, there's an article on interest in veganism, the, the interest of veganism surging. Um, and it explains some of the reasons why. But I think um, China has, uh, uh, has, a, has a unique role in this global movement. There are two key issues in 21st century vegetarianism. When China is the biggest importer of, soy, of soybeans, it is completely different from the era of uh, Li Shizheng and Sun Yat-sen. Now China is the biggest, China, China's um, domestic production of soybeans is not sufficient for its own use. It has to import a lot of soybeans. It is about food safety and food security. And it is also about threatened biodiversity. It is about a distorted crop and food system. So these are the claims of present day vegetarians. Now this graph, show um, the, um, uh, the production, the, the global production of soybean. You can see that uh, between uh, the Ameri uh, US, Brazil, and Argentina, you know, they were the biggest producers and they dominate world market of soybeans. You know, they take terms in terms of, you know, uh, price and everything. And poor China, uh, you know, one century after, later, instead of producing, 80% of soybeans is only produced 4.1%. And it's largely insufficient for it, even for its own use. And uh, for some data in uh, China last year imported more than 100 million tons of soybeans, which is an increase of 100 times in 25 years. And most of these imported beans were GMO, uh, genetically modified, uh, products used for animal feed, especially for pigs, um, uh, feeding pigs, and oil. It is largely because of the rise of the number of eating people. You know, China in the past had been poor, so now people have become wealthier, they could afford meat, they eat a lot more meat than before, and so you need to have, you know, the cattle industry, the pig raising industry, they need a lot of animal feed, and so they have to import um, this huge amounts of um, GMO soybeans from the Americas. And in Taiwan, fairly similar, you have 80% um, of imported beans are for oil and animal feed. So 
So um, uh, both Taiwan and China have similar problems, but on a different scale. Actually, the, the middle class, the vegetarians, and some of the intellectuals, you know, the public concern about um, the, this, this uh, crop uh, system is about the concern about contaminated meat. Con uh, the cons concern was marked in China and in Taiwan. Um, so they, 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 some complained about the meat was not as tasty, tasty as before because they were fed on low quality crops, what they call si liao rou. And, and sometimes the meat could be contaminated by antibiotics and so on and so forth. But this is not um, something that we discussed today, but about the, um, the use of soybeans as fodder. And let us look at, uh, you know, Taiwan, uh, the locally grown beans, uh, which is uh, all the locally grown beans in China and in Taiwan were, were used for food processing, for human use, and they were not for animal feed. So, um, so this graph show, show that um, the amount uh, that the, the Taiwan locally produced soybeans can only meet less than 1%, something like 0.2%, of domestic need for food. So, so you can see how insecure the food problem is in Taiwan. So it, um, the, 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 the soybean um, uh, uh, production as a, a global production problem and the uh, global trade problem actually threatened nutrition security, not only in Taiwan, in China, but in the whole of Asia. Let, me, let us look at some of the figures in Singapore. So Singapore now only produces 10%, 10% of protein food needed. Um, and, and, and now Singapore targets uh, reaching 30% in, in 2030. In Japan, uh, now only grows 7% of soybeans needed to make food. In Taiwan, uh, as, as we have just seen, um, it now grows only 0.1% of soybeans needed to make food. And in China, now grows only 15% of soybeans needed to make food. Um, so this is not a very desirable situation for East Asian countries, which used to be major producers of soybeans. And there is also um, very severe environmental concerns, deforestation, destruction of uh, the savanna in Latin America for soil cultivation. And so, and so you have this, in, in Taiwan, the reaction to the situation uh, began to, to emerge in the, in around 2008, 2010 when um, the government encouraged the peasants to recultivate black beans. And that policy became uh, strengthened in 2016, uh, called uh, the, the Great Granary Plan, the Da Liang Chang Ji Hua. Um, the fact is that um, when uh, in the 1960s, when, chi when, when Taiwan began to import American soybeans, um, the peasants gradually abandoned the cultivation of soybeans um, since it is no longer profitable. And then since 2001, when Taiwan joined WTO with reduced tariffs on imports and less state protection of domestic crop prices, Taiwan products became less and less competitive. And more, there were more peasants who gave up the land, gave up cultivation. And so Taiwan then relied almost entirely on imported American beans for human food consumption, though about 90% of these um, uh, crops imported were GMO, maybe more suitable for animals and for oil making and not that suitable for human consumption. So the movement of recultivation of indigenous black beans 
in Taiwan called Da Dou, Da Dou Fu Beng, began really seriously systematically in 2010, leading to the promotion of organic farming in 2011 and to this um, Da Liang Chang in 2016. And peasants are now relearning the art of growing black beans, um, growing, um, growing soybeans as traceable agricultural product, tap, reliable food source, because since it is grown domestically, you, you, can be, you, you can make sure that this is not GMO and, and you can make sure that this is safe for human consumption. So this, this movement is all over Taiwan, especially in central and southern part of the island. And so you have this uh, regrow soybeans preserved biodiversity. They call it Zaliang, Jiu Guo Lun, Zaliang, miscellaneous grains, um, in particular soybeans, indigenous soybeans, to save the country. And this is uh, our dear Professor Lam and his lab on um, soybeans, on the scientific research on soybean breeds. And the name is also very similar to, to the idea we find in Taiwan, it's like recultivating soybeans and uh, you know, re-domesticating uh, our indigenous breeds of soybeans. So, the question we can ask is, will the growing vegetarian economy and trend to develop heritage food help to change the current distorted crop and food system? This is a question I ask myself all the time because this is not easy at all. But there's some, a, bit, a little bit of hope maybe. I see, for example, a lot of creativity of new foods uh, made of local soybeans, and this, this is a, um, uh, you know, a, a spectrum of new soy foods um, made by, uh, from black beans um, and displayed in many museums and, and uh, of, en of enterprises. And also, there is a developing high tech of making plant-based meat as um, a very lucrative business. Uh, this is an ad of a, of a Taiwan uh, enterprise. And uh, we know that there is a more famous one called Beyond Meat or, or uh, Impossible Meat in, 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 in America. Actually, the, the, the person who invented that technique was from, from Taiwan. And also, there's this middle class titos, um, the, the desire for high end, safe heritage foods. Um, for growing niche markets, you, you know, they, they are ready to pay hundreds of dollars for a bottle of heritage soy sauce. Would that make a difference? And then high-end new style vegetarian restaurants that we find a lot in, in Taiwan and increasing number in China. So the last question I would like I would invite everybody to think about is, um, can Sun Yat-sen's vision for China back in 1911, uh, where you know, China was the main producer of soybeans and, and there is a, a balance of um, food consumption and agricultural economy, uh, which he thought was the basis for a, a modern, strong China. But that vision he realized in the 21st century by um, uh, that completely changed global trade in soybeans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nan. Um, before we start the Q&A session, I would like to uh, invite everyone to take a group photo. So please turn on your camera so that we can uh, take a group photo together. So I guess we have uh, more than 70 audience today. So we'll, we, will, we will have to take a few photos. So please unmask yourself <laughs> so that we can see you. So Joanna, is it, are you ready? 
Okay, so, so let's smile and take pictures. Okay, so, okay, thank you very much. Now we open for Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can either unmute yourself and talk or you can write on the check box. So please um, start the question. So I, I, I see uh, Albert has already unmuted yourself. <laughs> I, we cannot hear you though. Could you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so there, there's a movement in the United States. It's about like... Oh, Albert, uh, can, can you speak louder? Oh, okay. There, there is a movement in the United States about the vegetarian meat and so on. One of the things is about President Biden mentioned about the carbon emission. So do you really see that actually taking advantage of this whole movement of not eating that much of the real meat because there's a calculation done about that every beef that we consume, that how much carbon dioxide and so on is being emitted. Do you see that sort of a trend? So uh, this is my question number one. My question number two is related to my late father. So we are the Nang, we, we are, we are, we are Chaozhou Ren. So the, in the Chaozhou custom, we always have this Pu Ling Dou Zhang. And then we actually have the, the yellow bean and in a very salty water. And it seems to me almost that, that my dad is so attractive to him. And, and I don't think that even if, you know, that's the first thing that he would ask. It's like, where is my doujang? Where is the, the doujang is not really a doujang per se, not in the Cantonese sense, but actually is more or less like a soy sauce, but in the, in the Chaozhou provinces. As uh, uh, Professor Leung, you're really reading a lot of this sort of stuff, and maybe maybe Dr. Lam could also free bean and whatever. I, I feel that it's very addicting. It's just really like, like, uh, you know, until the very last day that he's in the hospital, he still asks for it. So I do not know what the magic and the trick, but I do think that if Shen Yixin's vision need to really be realized, we start really need to feed the babies with the soybean product. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think for the first question, it's pretty easy to answer. I think everybody agrees that um, uh, the cattle industry um, uh, is very de detrimental to the environment, and not only uh, carbon dioxide, but also methane. Um, and, uh, and also the, 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 the fact that they, have, they, they are destroying um, the tropical forests um, for soybean cultivation to feed cattle. I think this is a terrible um, uh, procedure. And um, I agree with President Biden that this has to be stopped at some point. Um, as for your second question, I, I don't quite get the, the Chaozhou um, condiment. What is the name of that? I, I, I don't cannot get your question for uh, the second one. Yeah, but you need to unmute yourself. So it's, it's more or less like a soy sauce, but the, the Chaozhou Yan may on soy sauce. Ke. What they do is that they will give you a little, little of the uh, soy Chaozhou Chai Diu Diem, you have to dip on it. You have to dip on that particular sauce, which is actually with the yellow bean, yellowish, and then with the Yim Soy Hai Dou. But actually it's for dipping. So what I'm really trying to draw the parallel is that if we really need everybody to consume a be a vegetarian, we have to build this sort of habit very early on. So my dad is born and grew up in China. Then after 1949, he, he fled and then he come to Hong Kong. But that is actually with him all the time, like every day. Yes. Okay. Thank uh, you. So thank you, Albert. I would like to um, supplement that based on the carbon dioxide. Oh, sorry. So I would like to supplement a bit on the carbon dioxide story because uh, cow and also sheep, they, are, they can produce methane, as uh, Angela said. So it, this is the worst meat that we can consume. 
So chicken and pig is a little bit better, but it's always uh, better to consume protein from plant. And more than that is when you want to eat meat from animal, you need to feed the animal with plants, such as soybean. So you are wasting a lot of uh, food because you need to produce the animal and it causes the problem of food security too. So that's something that uh, we have learned when we are doing our soybean research. So that is the question I received from the chat box. So I just uh, how read it out. So one question about soy allergy. So any historic records about that at all? As Chinese and vegetarian, um, let's see. Yeah. So uh, I became aware of this very late in my life, only from my Western friends. I wonder whether there's something that we could find interesting historical records about it. So, um, do there be any energetic response towards soybean, just just like peanuts? Because a lot of Asian uh, and other people are allergic. allergic to peanuts. But how about soybean? I I I don't know that problem too well. I believe that uh, there are uh, there is problem of allergy to soybeans and. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, there are allergies to all kinds of food. So um, I think uh, soybeans inevitably um, is one of those those uh, uh, foods that cause allergy. Uh, but still, I think um, uh, it can it can be useful. You know, the majority of people who don't have that allergy problem. Yeah, you know, milk also, right? Uh, you have lactose resistance. I mean, many people cannot digest milk. So, so I don't think that's a major uh, obstacle to use soybeans as food. Yes, I, I agree with uh, Professor Leung. So um, many food has allergenic response, in, including rice. So some people are um, allergic to rice, but it depends on the percentage of the population that are allergic to such food. So apparently soybean is much better than peanuts in terms of the percentage of people who, who are allergic to this uh, food. But so. actually, yes, and actually, uh, when soy milk was first used in the Republican period, there was there's an excuse that since many Chinese cannot digest milk, you know, cow milk, they could turn to soy milk, <laughs> uh, which, I mean, for that, they don't have lactose uh, uh, tolerance. Okay, so, um, May I have the next question, please? Hi, this is Joanna, uh, Joanna Chen. Um, uh, my question and a comment is um, a very interesting talk, uh, Professor Long. Very interesting. <laughs> I love many things. I think uh, there are some misunderstanding or the news circulating around because I get questions from quite a few different individuals. They ask that, they say soya milk will cause infertility on male, you know, on, on the men. And so um, uh, people are afraid to drink soya milk or eat soybeans. So there is this uh, misunderstanding, but looking at the Chinese population with so long history of eating soybean, Chinese population did not decrease. <laughs> Still quite a large population. So was there any mentioning or record about this, uh, this um, infertility uh, question? I'm not aware of that problem. <laughs> I've never read that in, in my sources. <laughs> but I just mentioned because uh, we get this question quite often. So I just <laughs> wanted to... <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, I, I guess uh, based on... I guess based on the population of Chinese, right? So <laughs> I don't think there is any fertility questions, right? So, but anyway, I uh, thank you for uh, Dr. Chen's question. So I received another question uh, from the chat box. So um, this is about, about one of the data talking about the increase of the vegetarian restaurant in China from 2016 to 18, but then dropped in 2019. I, I guess it's, does the chart only show the increase of the number of restaurants, not the total number, right? So maybe uh, Professor Leung can explain that. Because that is a chart. Yes. According, 
to my reading is it's talking about the number of restaurants added. Yes. Not not the total. So that's that's no job. It just add more. But the way but I think, to, I think yeah. 2019 is due to the COVID that there's not it, the, the adding of the new restaurant has job already been. Yes, right? this is right. Okay, so hopefully they, they yes. can explain it. And then the other question is now while G non GMO soybeans are imported for human consumption, many GMO soybeans for this from animal feed. So is there any discussion there may be a concern about human health for the GMO? Yes, actually, that's, that's one of the main public concern in Taiwan, that, um, you know, whether GMO is suitable for human consumption is very controversial. Um, but the fact that um, since imported soybeans uh, from the Americas are very, very cheap, and, and local soybeans cannot compete with them. Uh, the food process processes, the, the food companies, they, they sometimes, in order to make profit, they will just use imported GMO, no matter whether this is suitable for human consumption or not, they use it to make human foods. So there's the, a food uh, safety problem there, and, and you know, the consumers cannot they are not. They do not know whether that that product was safe or not. So that's why this um, there's this promotion of um, using only local products for human consumption because you can be, because only uh, non-GMO uh, soybeans can be grown allowed to, to be grown in Taiwan. So so these are traceable and reliable uh, food sources. So, so that's. It's really about some um, uh, untrustworthy uh, businessmen who use um, uh, not you know, uh, 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 GMO products for animal feed and, and make, use that sort of to make human food. Okay, so um, I, 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 I see a question from Henry Chen. So Henry, can you just spit out your questions yourself because I, don't quite understand your question. So, Henry, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Yeah, so yes. Okay. Uh, I'm asking this question because uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, as mentioned, that uh, in China, I want the high consumption of so this maybe due to the uh, for the purpose of feeding cattle instead of uh, feeding people uh, in some ways or others. So maybe uh, in increase in producing for the productivity of soil beans, it is really helpful uh, in, and, uh, in some sense for how many does it impact in, uh, in the compensating the uses or the usage or the consumption of the soil beans by the cattle. Because uh, I, I, I do not know the exact number, so I, I don't know if they want to be those are really extremely high that uh, the land or resources of our increase may not be able to support for the situation. Okay, I guess due to the, the sound problem, so let, <laughs> let me try to rephrase your question. So uh, we have discussed about the uh, soybean use as feed for animals. I guess um, not only cattle, but it may be used for pigs and others. Yes. And in this case, right, so how could the increase of productivity of soybean help to solve this kind of problem? Would, would, would the increase of productivity make a significant impact? How significant the impact is, I, I cannot answer, but I think I answered it partly in, the, in, the, in my answer to the last question. And that is, if you increase domestic production of soybeans, meaning that you have better control um, of the uh, uh, the sources of, of the soybeans, I mean, because only non-GMO uh, soybeans for human use can are allowed to, to be. I'm, I'm talking about Taiwan because I cannot have, have not done any research on China, so I don't know how the situation is in China. Uh, is presented but in Taiwan. The argument, uh, if you use, since locally produced uh, soybeans are reliable, 
then they can they can you know if you use if you use a lot of that if you have an increase of domestic production so that will reduce the, the dependence on you that's the idea but, but, but of course the, the margin is too big the difference is too big the, the import is you know eight percent of use of, of usage is, is from from import so so even if there is a prog progress to make it, it it is going to be very slow okay yeah the volume of soy we need is quite large yes yeah so uh, I have another question. Um, the question is, how about uh, producing organic soybeans together with the European Organic Agricultural Products Company? Will it be a way to uh, collaborate and change the situation of protein production? So I guess this is more on the production side. Yes, <laughs> so probably. Professor Lang is, uh, is uh, um, I'm a historian, so <laughs> so I I'm not a policy maker, and um, I I can only study things that have already happened. But for this thing, I it looks it sounds like a feasible solution. Uh, it, it just I mean, how to make it happen is another question. Yeah. So I guess um, this is a big give out like opportunity for colleagues in Africa because. Mm -hmm. um, you don't go if you haven't have a long history of going GMO or you have new fields that you can develop, maybe you can consider cultivating organic soybean and work with the European country who are in favor of organic food. Maybe that is a way to get more income by, by going soybean. I, I think this is one uh, possibility. So then I receive another um, questions so they talk about soy milk okay so the question is recently another popular plant-based product is oatmeal mm -hmm. other than soy milk mm -hmm. and many other plant-based products are promoted non-soy plant protein like peas etc so is it possible that this is the current wave of modernization of vegetarian movement will uh, try to move. Right, let me see. I right, cannot wait. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to move away from soil. So I, I guess the problem is that a lot of people know that um, vegetarian protein is good, but they are competitors. There are other plant-based protein products. So how sustainable and how what is the future of the soy product, will it still be competitive? Well, I, I think uh, soy is not just only made for, uh, uh, to make milk. There's a lot of stuff that soy, soy can do. You know, tofu is still a very popular food. And, um, and as, as I just indicated in, in the talk, that um, uh, you, you, can, you can make plant-based meat with soy, soy, uh, with soy meats, and it's very lucrative, it's extremely lucrative business. Um, and I don't think, uh, you can also make plant-based meat with other things, but I think soy is still the, the most um, uh, uh, used um, legume to make that product. And, and I do think that uh, soy um, has a lot of the value of soybeans is that it, you can use it to make very different things. So it's, it's not just a milk. Um, but anyway, so long as people are consuming more um, plant-based food, it is good for the planet and good for the um, and good for the human population. Well, I, so I just like to add my. Uh, two cents. So, for food like beverage, it, it depends on the flavor. Okay, so some people like um, soy flavor, some people do not like. So, working on the flavor of the of a, a beverage may be important to promote the particular plant-based protein drinks, and. In terms of protein, most of the other, the other uh, 
beans, right? not soy beans, the other legumes, the average um, per weight uh, protein is about 20 to 30 percent. But for soybeans, 40 percent. So if you want to have a protein rich um, diet or protein rich drink, soybean is always the choice. And soybean, in addition to making drinks, it can make different products like soy sauce. I, I don't think you can replace the soybean <laughs> with other things to make the soy sauce. And then Actually, after, you can. And really, yes. yeah, we can try, we enjoy, right? <laughs> so, and uh, because, of, because of the high percentage of protein that will make amino acids, that is the reason why soybean is the, is the preferred um, materials for making soy sauce. Because you, if, even though you can replace it, the, the percentage of amino acids is lower, then you need to have more seeds to, to input. And in the tradition of East Asia, soybean can also make tofu, fragmented tofu, and many fragmented products. And they are also common in Korean and also uh, Japanese restaurants to have different kinds of uh, soybean food. So, so long as you can make a recipe that can uh, tailor for different flavors and different, um, and introduce culture to a new nation, I think that will, that will probably be the way, the way to go, right? Okay, so, um, all right, so, yeah, so I think that that's a question I think um, related said that sometimes some people are worried about the soy milk because of the, the taste, the soy taste, right? So you want to comment on that because <laughs> soy milk has some taste that the Chinese like very much, but yeah. not the other uh, yeah. other, other people. No products can please everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess this question, uh, what I can suggest is that um, you can add other flavors to soybean. So uh, one, one uh, uh, very useful very flavor, flavor is chocolate. Is chocolate. So if so you if add chocolate to soy milk, you basically cover the, the, the soy taste. So that's some way so that you can handle it. Yeah. So um, yeah. So so the so the comment from from who asking the question about the vegetarian vegetarian um, uh, drinks is because I'm talking about the organic soybeans because naan naan right so who live in Europe and finding that the European supermarkets is very easy to get organic tofu, organic soybean and soy, and soy milk. So uh, he gave us a very interesting suggestion that maybe we should collaborate with the European company. So I also suggest this to our South African friend because it may be a way to get more income by going soybean. Okay, so let's see whether we have other questions? Oh, so another question, right? So, um, for Professor Leung, so you mentioned the political elites and NGOs in mainland, such as uh, Liang Shi, right? So, what do you think about the roles they have played on food transformation? Did their works on food, especially on education, are really helpful? So the question is whether whether these kind of NGO or our advocates really work in China by by transforming the the, the food habit. Um, I, I think they I, I think they are doing very good work. Uh, they are not political elites. They are as I said, they are. Uh, that, what sort of you have to turn on your yeah. Uh, the NGOs, the Liang Shi, they are not political elites. They are, as I said, they're middle class people, and I think they are uh, doing a good job in um, educating. Not, no, not, not by teaching people, you know, what is right and what is wrong. But I think they are doing a lot of very interesting um, activities, like organizing um, uh, vegetarian meals and inviting people to uh, give talks on on very vegetarian foods and inviting uh, chefs from different um, cultures to make very uh, to make uh, vegetarian food for festivals. So I didn't taste the food because I just watch it on, on, on my computer, but I, but I thought that those events were extremely attractive. And um, 
And just like the vegetarian restaurant that I that I know a little bit better in Taiwan, they are not like the um, the old style uh, Chinese vegetarian restaurants that will have mock meat, uh, you know, mock uh, uh, pig, mock the uh, chicken, mock duck. But they are um, they, they they look more Italian than, than Chinese, and and it's very beautiful to look at, and it look very tasty. So so it attract people. To at least to try vegetarian eating, and and not to uh, portray vegetarian eating as a religion or as something that is restricted. But you, you portray it something attractive, something interesting, something you want to know a little bit more, something you want to try. Uh, and I think this is really the way to go. Yeah, I I, I guess it's difficult to just uh, lecture someone to eat something, right? Yeah. It's better to treat the the person to eat something that they yeah. like. So uh, just sharing the cultural food will be one way to promote um, environmental, healthy, vegetarian food. Okay, so um, is there any other questions? I haven't seen any from the chat box. Okay, so if there's no uh, further question, let me do some uh, advertisement. <laughs> so for the next talk, Okay, so uh, thank you everyone uh, for your active participation and discussion. So our uh, next talk will be on a different topic. So the intangible assets of agrobiotechnology by Dr. Albert Weiqi Chen, who is a lawyer and yet having a PhD degree in biology. So this talk aims at exploring intentions of intangible assets, including intellectual property rights, plant variety rights, database, regulatory approvals, internet and other information networks. So please uh, register now via the QR code and we will also email you the registration details. So uh, we are looking forward to uh, Albert's talk in next month. So with that, I thanks everybody for, for attending today's session. and. Uh, Good morning or good night, whatever. <laughs> we say goodbye for now. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.